Oh. Okay, I think the recording missed for a little bit. Doesn't matter. Um, so this mapping SV, which is this PV minus T0, P being an isometry, is an isometry which takes 0 to 0. And since SEI is a basis, that means S S3 is a combination and you can even find out the coefficients of AI because you know SEI and SEJ are orthogonal. So whenever you write like this, AIs are, uh, you can recover them simply as SV dot SEI. Okay, you take dot product of SV with um, any SEJ, then only AJ survives here. Because of that, we have, and we know the S preserves dot product, so AI can also be regarded as V dot EI. So when I write like this, immediately things become clear that S is an indeed linear. We want to say S of V1 plus V2 is S V1 plus S V2. So S of V1 plus V2 is just V1 plus V2 dot EI. And since this is linear, V1 dot EI plus V2 dot EI, so we get this. similarly you get S of lambda means. So S is linear, it is matrix with respect to the canonical basis whose ith column is the vector SEI. Notice that. This is an orthogonal matrix. That is what is meant by saying this is an orthonormal basis. So isometries are essentially, apart from translating to make zero go zero go to zero, just ortho orthogonal matrix. Action by so linear action by an orthogonal. So remember the definition of isometry doesn't involve any linearity, but it's four terms. Okay. So this I added this comment also. Because someone asked me a question uh, evening last evening during tutorials, and I mentioned that uh, generically this whatever matrix she was asking is invertible, you know, diagonalizable, and uh, not only generically you can say much more precisely. So let me just look at a skew symmetric matrix. Then clearly we know that its eigenvalues are zero or purely imaginary. You would have seen this elementary. You would have seen it in a number of lectures in the beginning. The eigenvalues have to be either zero or purely imaginary. Therefore, what are the eigenvalues of this? So, in fact, eigenvalues of any lambda i plus s will be lambda plus eigenvalues of s. Since it is zero or purely imaginary, for example, whenever lambda is a non-zero real number, definitely this is an inevitable matrix. The eigenvalues are lambda plus s. Similarly, so in, in particular, identity plus s is always invertible. So, in fact, you can say when it is not invertible. Namely, suppose the eigenvalues of S are purely imaginary and lambda equals minus of that. So one of the so I, lambda equal to the eigenvalues of minus S will give non-invertible. Otherwise, it's always invertible. So now, thing is, once you know that for SQ symmetric matrix, this is invertible, you look at this matrix, remember I minus S and I plus S will commute as matrices. So you can easily use that to show that this is an orthogonal matrix. This is trivial exercise. So given any skew symmetric matrix, this matrix is in ON. It's an orthogonal matrix. Just check by looking at A transpose A and then use the fact that I minus I and I plus S commute. You'll get that it's an orthogonal matrix. Actually, it's a nice exercise to find out which orthogonal matrices you get as this in this form. And what are the orthogonal matrices? We do not, we don't get of this form. What is missing? Hmm. Fact that this orthogonal is very easy to check, but what is the image? Hmm. So this is called sometimes called Cayley transform. Okay. So as I said, skew symmetric matrices form the tangent space as identity of the orthogonal group. So it's also called the Lie algebra of uh, orthogonal group. Lie algebra of orthogonal group is this space of skew symmetric matrices. Similarly, for unitary group, you have skew Hermitian matrices. Again, you have a similar mapping called Keeley transform. So I just mentioned in passing because someone asked me a question yesterday. This is the correct occasion to. Okay, now let's come to another type of uh, mm -hmm. decomposition, which is called Iwasawa decomposition, which holds in a general, uh, in a more general form. So this is all these decompositions are something like we have a linear group, a big group. You want to break it up into smaller subgroups. Hello, sir. The product of various subgroups as a set. 
Hello, sir. Either. Yes. Sir, on the last slide. Hmm. One second. Hmm. Hmm. Sir, here uh, actually we did not talk about diagnosability of uh, this lambda e plus yes, right? Yeah. I'm talking about invertibility. Hmm. Yeah. So when the eigenvalues are distinct, of course. No, it right? could be same. Mm -hmm. Maybe like algebraic multiplicity and geometric multiplicity could be same for some particular yeah. uh, lambda. True, but as I said, generically it is invertible. Genetically it is diagonalizable. Generically, for an open set, open dense set of lambdas, and uh, it will be diagonalizable. Because when do they coincide? So there are very. Uh, you cannot say say the number, but you can say that for an open dense set of lambdas, it is going to be. Diagonalizable. Okay, let's discuss this more in the tutorials if you wish. Okay, okay. I just mentioned okay. this in past. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Mm. Go ahead, and so, so uh, I said I mentioned there is this word decomposition I'm using here because what we want to do is you want to break up a group, pick group into smaller subgroups. When you say break up, I mean as a product of subgroups, but this product is of course not as a group, as a set. And often this uh, decomposition is has nice topological properties. For example, it's a product of two subgroups, and the product map is a homeomorphism, etc. Things like that. So one of them is called Iwasawa decomposition. And I, since I am mentioning these things only in uh, not in full generality, you should know that this holds in much more generality. But um, I am saying it only for GLN, and that is nothing but nothing more, nothing less. Than the Gram Schmidt process. So let me just recall. <clears throat> so every matrix which is invertible, real matrix n by n, can be uniquely expressed as um, orthogonal matrix times an upper triangular in invertible matrix, where all the diagonal entries are positive. Okay. Of course, without this condition, we can do, but this additional condition makes uh, makes it nicer. I'll tell you why. Some uniqueness it gives. So how can you manage this? I'll tell you the proof, of course, but uh, how can you manage this? When you think about it, the diagonal matrices which are have negative de uh, determinant, that means diagonal entries which are negative and so on, we can take care of by pushing it into ON. ON has matrices which have also negative determinant one matrices. Okay, so because of that. So let's see what, why this, why I'm saying this decomposition holds. So this is a, so it's like a full page I've given, but it's a very trivial and well-known thing, all of you know. So this proof of decomposition is actually equivalent to this process that one calls as Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. So look at uh, your matrix G, you are given a matrix G which is invertible. So it means <clears throat> column sub G, there is G E1, G E2, G E N is this a basis of Rn, hmm? general basis now. Right, G is in a general invertible matrix, so it's a general basis. So what we want to get is an ortho orthonormal basis. So what we do is this, this process, which I just recall very quickly, and all of you can know that. The first vector you normalize to make it a unit vector, and second vector V2 you change by a uh, you ch change by a multiple of this, so that it becomes orthogonal to it, and that is this multiple. Okay, the inner product of this with V1 is V2 V1 minus V2 V1 W1 W1, sorry. Uh, and W1 W1 is 1 because we had normalized it. So this is just orthogonal to this. And to make it a unit vector again, we do, do this. Now, how, did I, how can I do this? Because this is a base, this is non zero okay, vector. Similarly, this is also non zero vector. Okay, because this is a basis, this combination cannot be zero. That's why I can divide by always normalize. So in general, if you have, we have con constructed uh, the ith one, then i plus one vector basis vector will be or some. It is w j is missing here. Mm -hmm. So this net per, this uh, scalar time w j summing over that some j to one to i. So we are changing the j th by. So just imagine what this process is. Why I wrote down explicitly, although it's well known, is that you see this in front of you. What you are doing is each vector here. You are changing by linear combination of previous ones. You are not touching the next ones. Only the previous ones you are touching. And you are normalizing, you can scaling. You are dividing by this norm. Okay. Now, once you watch this, look at this carefully, 
this matrix whose columns are w i's is this is b times g right what is meant by so what is meant by changing basis you change v2 to v2 plus combination of v1 and then normalize v3 to v3 plus combination of v1 and v2 that is nothing but multiplying by a on the left side by an upper triangular matrix that's what this is doing so the action by an upper triangular matrix is what is accomplishing this ultimately what are we getting and of course notice one more thing we are always dividing out by something positive so that means <clears throat> this upper triangular matrix has all diagonal entries positive okay and finally this matrix that we have got after changing the basis to this orthonormal basis is an orthogonal matrix because it has basis of orthonormal vectors it is a set of columns of an ortho uh, orthogonal matrix orthogonal group orthogonal matrix so b of b times g is an orthogonal matrix Since the matrix whose columns form an orthonormal basis is in ON, we get BG is K. Okay, so the process is nothing but take a G, look at its columns, make it into an orthonormal basis using gram schmidt process that is equivalent to multiplying on the left side by an upper triangular notable matrix with positive diagonals. So this gives G is KB inverse. That means any any element of any invertible matrix is an orthogonal matrix times the upper triangular invertible matrix. So to say uniqueness, that is why I took this positivity here. Suppose you have two matrices, one uh, K1 and B1, K2, B2, K1 and K2 orthogonal matrices, B1 and B2 upper triangular matrices. Then take the Ks to one side, Bs to the other side. So in some sense, you remember ON is orthogonal matrix means transpose is inverse. Now transpose, if you have an upper triangular matrix, Transpose changes upper to lower. So only way you have, can have an intersection is it's diagonal. Okay. So this, this is a diagonal matrix being the intersection. But then eigenvalues and orthogonal matrix are absolute value one, which forces that since these are positive real numbers here, eigenvalues are positive real numbers here. That means only based at one. Diagonal matrix must be one. So this is what this is how you used positivity here of the diagonal entries of B. So <clears throat> What we have is going back, we have a unique clearly expressed as this. In fact, you can say much more here. The mapping from ON product with BNR, product mapping from ON cross BNR to GLNR, this mapping is a homeomorphism, diffeomorphism, etc. Okay. So sometimes you, you break up the upper triangular also into diagonal and the upper triangular uni, unitriangular matrices. So it's called K A N decomposition instead of just K B called K A N. It's called, and this holds more generally. It's called Iwasawa decomposition. Iwasawa is the name of a person. So we saw this is unique decomposition like this. Hmm? There is also related decomposition called Carthan decomposition, which we don't, which is very similar. I don't say anything about it. So I will talk about something called Bruja lemma. This is again very general and then. In um, the theory of algebraic groups, something called theory of algebraic groups, linear algebraic group, this is very, very crucial. I mean, it's very simple, but it's very useful uh, in the theory. But for GLN and so on, we can just say it very, very uh, explicitly. Okay. We can just say what this is explicitly. So this is this disjoint union of double cosets BWB. Okay. B is, of course, as before, upper triangular uni, uh, invertible matrices. W is a set of commutation matrices. You know, there are n factorial of them. Mm -hmm. Now, double coset means a set of this form. Okay. So, when you have a double coset like this, uh, of course, you have another double coset, say, uh, B, W dash B. Mm -hmm. These are two subsets of this. These kind of sets have, uh, okay. <clears throat> anyway, so these are, uh, what's called affine spaces. In fact, if you take, uh, for example, complex numbers here, K is complex numbers. This is for any field, but you take complex numbers. These are very nice affine spaces, but then when you look at the sort of closures in the Zariski topology, whatever that is, they give some singular spaces. Okay, And that is the sort of simplest way of the simplest singular spaces one can study. So why I mentioned this was that, when you talk about singular spaces and so on, singular varieties, 
this so called closures of these cells these are called super varieties they will uh, they are the simplest ones to study anyway we don't need any of those this is just uh, um, no i have given to making such unnecessary statements okay anyway so look at this bwb i want to say every uh, matrix gln is of the form b1 time w times b2 where w is a permutation matrix uniquely determined by this matrix b1 and b2 may not be uniquely determined okay for any g b1 w b2 as i said we are saying it is a disjoint union that means um, w is uniquely determined okay b1 w uh, bwb and b w dash b do not intersect and w is not equal to w dash but um there is no uniqueness about this b1 and b2 except we can make a unique form of it which is called i don't go into that it's called a, a normal form we can somehow write this p as unit triangular matrix u dash hmm, and times uh, t the t can be pushed because you see <clears throat> when you hmm, t will normalize this so t will will we can be pushed to this b2 that is why i wrote t here so it means here you can have some appropriate u dash which is you can say is uniquely determined okay essentially it is something like a uh, things in the unit triangular part of b intersection the negative of that conjugated by w what's called u intersection w u minus w inverse that u dash is in that then it is unique it's called normal form for the bruhar decomposition but anyway what we are concerned is only just proving this decomposition exists with there is unique w so let's see what the proof is here so as you see whenever you break up a group into smaller uh, subgroups and subsets and so on it's uh, it helps to useful to study the big group <clears throat> okay anyway one more comment i make is that look at the lower unit triangular matrices that means lower triangular matrices with ones on the diagonal which are denoted by u minus upper triangular matrices on the diagonal and they denoted by u okay so that is contained in here similarly you have the opposite of the transpose of that lower triangular matrices then u minus is inside that so suppose you look at u minus that is the lower ones with ones on the diagonal times all upper invertible so this set look at this big set this is a sort of large set in some sense okay this comes up it's a very nice exercise to check that precisely this is a dust subset of GLNK consisting of all matrices where all the principal minus are non-zero. Sometimes it's called a big cell. So it's a very big subset. So in other words, lower unit triangular times upper invertible gives almost the full group. Okay, this is one group, one group. This is product as a set. Okay, this is just a set. Okay, let's prove this uh, decomposition, Bruha decomposition. Maybe uniqueness we can discuss during tutorial. So Take any oh sorry, G is for GLNK. Fix any G in G, any notable matrix for any. So this is how you do it. One of the ways of doing it is the following. So look at various elements of B, and look at the matrix B times G. So B times G is some invertible matrix. So look at its rows. First row, second row. Say, uh, first row starts with A one zeros. Starts with A one zeros. Okay. A one could be zero. That means may start with a non-zero number, but it starts with A one zeros. Second row starts with A two zeros, like that. So this is for the matrix B times G. Now, what are the possibilities for AIs? No AI can be n because the matrix is invertible. No row can be zero. Okay, AI is n would mean that starts with n zeros means all the full row is zero. That means we have zero row, which is not possible for an invertible matrix. So each AI is between zero and n minus one. It may start with non-zero thing, or it may start with after some stage. So zero and n minus one are the the numbers are between zero and n minus one. Okay. So whatever b you take, b times g, look just count the number of zeros. It's the ith row starts with. Call it AI. These numbers are all between zero and n minus one. What we now do is, since we have some finite choice. Let's choose any b in B for which let's call it b naught, so that this sum a one plus a two plus a n number of zeros that they start with, that number is maximum possible. Number 
is maximum possible among the matrices B. What we want to say is that in that case, all the AAs are distinct, we want to say. We want to say all the AAs must be distinct in this case, okay, for the maximal choice. So there may be many more than one B giving this same choice, same number A1 plus A2 plus A. We don't, we don't care. Just want one, to cut one B, B for which this number is maximum. Because this number is a finite choice only. So <clears throat> we claim that for any such choice of B, this must be distinct, as I mentioned. So why is that? So if not, so let's say i row starts with some AI number of zeros, and j row also starts with aj number of zeros, where AI is aj. So both i row and j row start with same number of zeros. Starts with means what? After the AI, there is a non-zero element, non-zero entry. Now we can imagine what we'll do. We want to make another choice so that this numbers, this sum increases. How do you manage that? It's simply by multiplying by a matrix, okay, which has only entry at the ijth place, an appropriate entry so that we multiply on the left side this matrix BG. What happens? That means we can kill off <clears throat> um, the AI, the ith row, so that it becomes one more zero there, and you are not affecting any other rows. That means you increased this AI by one. Okay, and not touch the other edges. So that means you have, uh, uh, you are contradicting the maximality of this. In other words, only way uh, we can have maximality is that none of the AIs are same. All the AIs are distinct, but there are n numbers all between zero and n minus one. So these numbers a1, a2, an must be the numbers 0 to 1 minus 1 in some order. And what does that mean? This matrix that you get here, matrix in which uh, a1, a2, an is 0 to n minus 1 in some order is nothing but hmm, your permutation matrix. So in other words, it is a actually it is a, so the, it's a permutation matrix except that at each point it may not have one as an entry, but it may have some non-zero entry. So permutation matrix, you can write, so a matrix of that kind, you can write as a permutation matrix times a diagonal matrix. So that's how we get the Bruha decomposition. Okay, because what we wanted was what? We want, when you multiply your uh, G by, on the left-hand side with some B, so this is your B1 inverse, you've got some permutation matrix times um, an element here. Hello, See, sir. What is the matrix for which A1, A2, An is 0, 1 to N minus 1 in that order? A1, A2, An or 0 to N minus 1 in that order, that is nothing but an upper triangular matrix. Right? Upper triangular matrix, A1 is 0, A2 is 1, A3 is 2, etc. Upper triangular invertible matrix is exactly for which A1, A2, An is 0 to N minus 1 in that correct order. So now we have in some order, then you can put it in correct order by, by permutation. Why is this permutation unique? That is uh, easy, but uh, anyway, I explained this, why, how you made the maximal, if, the, if they are same, then they are, um, then you can increase AI by one and not affecting others. I, I'll give you the correct choice of the here. IJ entry, you take minus U by V, okay? I throw is this thing, then you can do this. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, here, uh, did you assume like if uh, I throw has k uh, zeros? Mm -hmm. Yes. So does it mean after k, all non zero it is. Zeros? After k, it is non zero. When I say exactly, that's a, okay. this thing, that's what I mentioned once, but let me make it very clear. Okay, sorry, here. When I say here, ith row of BG starts with AI zeros, when I say that, I mean exactly AI zeros. Okay, so definitely after the AI zeros, there is a non-zero entry. That's what is meant here, okay? I should change and the language. That, hmm. yeah, after that, there are no zeros possible. No, no, we're not saying. After that, definitely zeros are possible. We are only talking okay, about the beginning, the only the beginning. Okay, okay, beginning, okay, okay. AI zeros, and we have next entry is non-zero. After that, you don't, you don't care. Okay, okay. Okay. 
you know why because what we are doing is when you think of upper triangular matrix invertible matrix that means first and first row starts with non zero second row starts with zero and then non zero like that third row starts with zero zero and non zero so these are the numbers a1 a2 an in the order 0 1 2 and minus 1 so what we are trying to say is any invertible matrix you can chain by upper triangle matrix on the ref to make it so that it looks like upper triangle except the the this is on different order that is why permutation comes okay so this is how i mentioned here this increases at least by one by making this choice okay let me just go through it u is the first non zero entry in the ith row v is in first non zero entry in the jth row we are assuming that ith row and jth row both start with ai zeros Okay, so they are, these are vertically above this. So your u is vertically above v. So you take t to be minus u by v and then um, when you multiply on the left hand side by the matrix whose entries are identity matrix, except ijth entry is this. So this is an upper triangular matrix and when you multiply by that, this becomes zero. In other words, you increased ai by one and you have not touched ajs and all. Because you see, when you multiply on the left hand side matrix whose ijth entry is this and only diagonal entries are all one, such a matrix is an upper triangle matrix and then you are not touching the other rows, letting them as it is. So because of this choice, no, these are 0 to n minus 1 in some order and so multiplying by the permutation matrix corresponding to this order, how to order 0 to n minus 1, then you get upper triangle matrix. Okay. When you multiply on the left hand side by permutation matrix, what you get is an upper triangle matrix because it's a, this is 0, 10, minus 1 in that order. And here is the uniqueness of uh, permutation, but we'll just maybe go over it in a tutorial or something. So now I'll uh, sort of come to another part, which is uh, special things. You now let's talk about, uh, we talked about linear groups over real numbers, complex numbers, general fields sometimes. So if you talk about very specific fields, as I said, We'll have rich theory in each of them, hmm? like over Lie theory, Lie groups. But if you talk about over integers, matrices of over integers, then again, there's a very, very, very rich theory. A lot of number theory comes in. But we just want to give a glimpse of something which is easy to see, hmm? important and easy to see. So talk a little about linear groups or integers. We start with something called Minkowski's lemma, Herman Minkowski. So here is this lemma. For any odd prime number p and any matrix hmm, um, <clears throat> okay. I should have said here any matrix whose determinant is plus or minus one. Okay. So I'm looking at a matrix in G L and Z. Any matrix with the integer entries determinant plus minus one is uh, they form a group called G L and Z. Hmm. Inverse is also integer matrix determinant plus minus one. Now what we are going to look at is this is infinite group, all right, but it will have many subgroups of many subgroups, and in particular, it will have subgroups of finite index. So, for example, if you have homomorphism from an infinite group to a finite group, the kernel of the homomorphism will be a normal subgroup of finite index here because this is finite. So, we are looking at this. What we are trying to say is that if we take any odd prime number P and take any matrix here of infinite order, then um, it doesn't, so in this, it does not have any uh, matrix of infinite order. That's what we want to say you know, for odd primes P. Means what we want to know is that when you want to uh, look at subgroups of what are the possible orders of uh, finite groups here, we'll have to go into this kernel. Okay, the kernel does not contain any subgroups of, so torsion free kernel of this homomorphism. What is this homomorphism? Take any matrix. So here is the matrix of integer entries. You reduce all the entries modulo p. So you have a matrix now whose entries are from z mod pz. Okay. Integers mod p. So this is again a group. And this matrix going to this matrix is a homomorphism of groups. And look at a kernel. What we are saying is that any element of um, finite order is mapping isomorphically to this. Any group. Of finite order mapping isomorphically to this. That means kernel does not contain anything of finite order. 
So in other words, to count finite subgroups, you have to count finite subgroups here. That is the advantage of this. Anyway, let's go to this. First, let's look at any prime, including two. So we'll write the matrix, your given matrix as identity plus P power D times B, where B is an integer matrix, of course. So you're looking at some, the power of P that you can take out possibly. Maximum power of P that you can take out possibly from the entries. So this is so from all the entries you have taken out this power. One plus identity plus P power D times B. So uh, to show something does not have any elements of finite order, it's enough to say there are no elements of prime order. Because there is an element of finite order, that finite order has a prime dividing it. Let's say order M. M is P times D. Then G power D has order P. G has order M, which is P times D. G power D has order M. So, uh, sorry, the order P. So, it is enough to say there are no elements of prime order. This prime has nothing to do with this P, okay? Just any prime. But we'll see it has something to do with this. Hmm. Suppose if possible, A has prime order, order a prime Q. We first claim that if at all it has an element of prime order Q, that prime must be the same prime. Okay, where are we looking? We are looking at elements in J L and Z going to J L and Z mod P. Hmm. And I return any matrix like this. This element is of um, order Q and we want to say this prime Q must be P. So let's look at, so it is a Qth order is, uh, Qth power is identity, but look, calculate the Qth power of this matrix. Okay, when you calculate Qth power by, you can just use the binomial thing and you'll have, you know, identity plus Q times this plus P power, so next terms you'll have P power 2D and so on. P power 3D and all that. Okay, when you look at the qth power of this. So only the first two sur survive. So this is, when I say modulo this, this means what? Uh, <clears throat> this is equal to i power q p, i plus q p power d b plus some matrix, which is of the form p power 2d times c. C is a matrix. Okay. These are not numbers. Okay. When I say modulo, it means plus p power 2d times a matrix. What is this equality give? This immediately gives that p power d will divide all the entries of because i and i are cancelling off. This i and i are cancelling off. So p power 2d is there. So when you, even if you cancel out the p power d, there is p power d remaining. So p power d will remain divide all the entries of b. This is a contradiction because you have chosen okay, b to be free of, you have taken out the full power, possible power of p. So, so if you take, even if in the case of q equal to p, is odd. The same um, equality reads now p power d plus only remember here q is there. This q is p in that case. Hmm? Q is p. If q is not p, you get a contradiction, right? As I said, p power d will divide this. If q is p, this is becomes p power d plus one. That's why I return here p power d plus one. Then also we can just look at you just calculate what, what power it is that 2d plus one. So, and then use the factor for a prime P, the binomial coefficients are multiples of P. Okay, and again, you get a contradiction unless P equal to two. Because this, this kind of accident happens only for, um, fails only for P equal to two. So, what I'm trying to say is that, okay, I'll, I'll not see this other proof, but I want to say that this will, we, we can discuss this during the tutorial for a reason. Because you will wonder what happened when p equal to 2. I mean, I mentioned the proof earlier that I gave was for odd prime p. Okay. For odd prime p, we showed that there is no element here of finite order which is not, which is in the kernel. Any element of finite order um, here will map to isomorphically, any that subgroup will map isomorphically to this. It does not intersect the kernel. And this is for any odd prime p. What happens when P is 2? Okay. Then we can say there is something which happens. Any matrix in this kernel of finite order does, they do exist. Something like order 1 or 2. Because order 1 means uh, nothing. Order 2. It looks like essentially something of this kind. So the reason I skipped the previous second proof was that the second proof can be adapted to prove this. Since I want to prove this during tutorial session, I'll recall the second proof also that during that time. But first proof should be clear. 
first proof is just this. So, okay, so you you take a write the matrix in the form i plus p power d by times b. Take out the full power of p from which is common to all the entries. That's what this means. And then if a has some prime order q, first you check that the q must be p because if q is not p, this kind of uh, equality will tell you p power d will divide b. It is a contradiction. When q equal to p, then you get p power d plus one. Then again you get a contradiction when the prime is odd. And then for two, we, you do have something like this. Anyway, so now let's come to this uh, group, special group, which is of course holds a very special place in number theory and many other situations. For example, in Riemann surfaces and all that. Okay, the group uh, SL2Z, the two by two integer matrix determinant one, as simple as that. Okay, very kind of simplest group you can think of in some sense with this uh, linear group because integer entries, but it is so complex that holds a huge world inside it. So sometimes this group or it's uh, quotient by plus minus identity is called a projective, projective special linear group or sometimes called a modular group. Okay. This is the, this holds the world of modular forms and so on inside it. Um, in fact, there is a joke which goes around or maybe it's not a joke anymore. There are five basic operations in mathematics, addition, Subtraction, multiplication, division, and modular forms. They say like that. So it's as basic as the modular forms. Even though you may not, many people may not know the definitions of modular forms, but you may be using it it's sort of hidden behind somewhere. It's working from behind. Hmm. Anyway, so SL2Z is the very basic group and it's quotient by plus minus identity. Uh, it's called the modular group. This is sort of everywhere pervading, ubiquitous there. And um, some of its group theoretic properties, let's look at. Hmm. So these are linear groups, right? Over integers. So this linear group over integers, this is, a, this is an infinite group. Hmm. For example, matrices one a zero one is there. No, for any a which is integer, one a zero one is there. So infinite group. But you see, so there's remarkable properties. For example, okay, let's look at these two matrices. This is of determinant one. This is of determinant one. So both are in SL two Z. We want to say that these two generate. Okay. And equal, so this is um, this upper triangular and this is lower triangular. You can get this and this X and Y generating is same thing as S and X generating. Mm -hmm. You can just get one from the other. Viewing it like this has advantages. And you say S, look at the matrix S, it has finite order. What is its order? When you square this matrix, you get minus of identity. That means S has order four, okay? And you know, now look at, if you want to get this lower triangular from S and X, it is like S, X, S inverse. Or S, X, X inverse will be Y inverse. Hmm. Okay, so like that, we can get one from the other. So these two generating, these are of an infinite order. One, one, zero, one is of infinite order because when you take the nth power of this, it becomes one and zero, one. Okay, only way it can become zero is, there is no post uh, finite n for which it becomes so this is of infinite order. This is also of infinite order. Okay. Although these are in some sense good to deal with because uh, they are like translations, but this is a finite order. So this and this will generate or another way of saying is that you can produce from S and X another matrix. If you multiply out this and this, huh, you'll get another matrix whose order is six. Okay, when you multiply this out. That means you've got a multiple of uh, uh, matrix of order four and the matrix of order six, which uh, generate SL2Z. So it's a big infinite group, just two matrices, one of order four, another of order six generated. In fact, viewing it here, these elements, because plus minus and you will see that an element of order two and an element of order three, just two elements will generate this infinite group explicitly. Okay, let's just see, this is one property. And in fact, uh, if you want to say it in slightly more fancy language, this group PSL2Z modular group is the free product of Z mod two and Z mod three. That is, that means there are there is an element of order two, an element of order three, and all words in them is this group. All words means all kinds of expressions, products. Any two expressions are different. That's what free product means. Okay, this matrix S and another matrix which I'll call as uh, I don't know U or something. That's of order three here. 
Hmm? We order six in this, but order three in PSL two Z. Anyway, so S and U. So any element of PSL two Z going to look like a word in S and U. Your language has two symbols only, two letters only, S and U, and everything, every word in that language is made up of S and U, and any two words are different. That's what free product means. That means S U S square. I mean S U S inverse is not uh, U power twelve. S power 5, something, something, another word. Any two words are different. Any two of this. Hmm? So images of S and SX, as I mentioned, have orders 2 and 3. These are the ones which give the structures. Actually, the matrix S itself has order 4. S times X will have order 6. Remember, X is order, infinite order. Okay. So we have two elements of finite order, which generates infinite group. And in fact, uh, so sort of can say generalization of this product, this free product condition is, or just pulling back from there, you get an equation like this. SL2Z is a group generated by two matrices X and Y. Uh, this is called a presentation for a group. Uh, so you have two matrices generating it. And what are the relations? Every relation between X and Y is gotten out of these two relations. Hmm? So this means X square equal to Y cube and X power four is identity. Of course, x square is y cube and x power 4 is identity would imply y power 6 is identity. Remember. Anyway, SL2Z has this presentation. So it's almost like a free product okay, of Z mod 4 and Z mod 6. It is just amalgamated along Z mod 2, which is a matrix minus identity, which becomes identity element when you go to PSL2Z. Now, again, it is an interesting question. Look at the group SL2Z. It's a non-abelian group. Okay, 1101 1, 1 and 1011 1, 1 will not commute. The upper triangle and lower triangle will not commute. Okay, but what is abelianization? What is abelianization of a group? That means you divide the group by its commutator subgroup. Okay, commutator subgroup is group generated by all x, y, x, n, y, y, y. So what is that group? It's some abelian group. What kind of group is it? Actually, it's so we can solve this during, uh, or maybe even now, we'll see. Actually, explicitly can say this. Okay, again, there are very interesting things. Groups J, L, and Z are quotients of SL2Z. So you see, J, L, and Z, it's, look at J, L, 5, Z, or something like that. It's a big group, right? I mean, it's bigger than this, but definitely still it's a quotient of this group. So all this is happening because in some sense, you can think of, Small bigger group can be a quotient of smaller group in the case of infinite groups. For example, if you think of free groups, free group of rank three is can be a quotient of free group of rank, the subgroup of free group of rank two, etc. Okay, so this is actually this is very striking. We may not have seen this unless you are in this subject. So all the GL and Z from some stage onwards are quotients. GL four Z is not and GL three Z. These things you can see by some elementary means. How do we get such, such, uh, such, what should I say, results? Because we know the structure of this. We know the matrices we generate. So that means this is the group is essentially at least PSL2 is a uh, free product of Z mod 2 and Z mod 3. You have two elements. So if, uh, if a group is what is called 2, 3 generated, 2, 3 generated means an element of order 2 and element of order 3 generate the whole group, then automatically it's a quotient of PSL2Z. So that is how we get this. So we have to somehow get hold of generators, two generators, one of order two, one of order three. So these groups have this. And this is a very rich theory again, uh, two, three generated and two, three, five generated, two, three, seven generated, which involves Riemann surfaces and so on, Hurwitz groups. So it's a very rich theory. I just mentioned this fact, which is a very interesting fact, because it looks like it could should be wrong, right? A big group being a quotient of a smaller group. And just to give an example, GL5Z, let me give explicitly, here are two elements of uh, which generate it. Okay? In fact, you can, in the case of GL5Z, you can even determine what are all the possible generators of order 2 and 3 uh, up to conjugacy. And we'll find that this is one of order 2, and the other one is here you have some choice, some 5, 6 choices, this column. This is the only choice. So you can even determine all the possible generators. So it's a very different kind of theory, but it's very interesting. Okay, the proof, again, come back to elementary fact here. 
Uh, what am I here? Yeah. Okay. I have a lot of time. So prove that every matrix expressible as a word in the four matrices. What is the matrix X? Remember, it is one one zero one. The upper triangular one one zero one. And this is the inverse of that, which means it is one minus one zero one. One minus one zero one. Similarly, this is lower triangle one zero one one. And this is one zero minus one one. So in other words, what we are saying is that everything is expressible as a word in um, these four symbols. But I am saying this is nothing mysterious about it. This is your familiar thing you know from high school, which is that you division algorithm, Euclid's division algorithm. So let's see why very quickly. So what we do is uh, take any matrix in SL2Z. You want to multiply on the left and right by some uh, powers of these things, reducing it to the identity matrix. Okay, take any matrix here and multiply on left and right by a number of times by powers of x and y. That means you're uh, to make it an identity. That means you got g equal to some product of powers of such things. That's what it means. So how does do that? That means uh, okay. So if even if you lead to one of the matrices, even if it leads to minus identity, it's enough because minus identity is expressible. I already mentioned here. Y inverse X whole cube is minus identity. That is your Z mod 3 in PSL 2Z. Hmm. You can just check this. Look at the matrix 1, 0, minus 1, 1 and 1, 1, 0, 1. Multiply out and take the cube and you find it's minus identity. Okay. So anyway, so what I'm going to do is take any matrix here, multiply on the left and right by powers of this so that it reduces to either identity matrix or minus identity matrix. And I'm saying that process is nothing but division algorithm. Okay, maybe it should do in tutorial session or maybe some things I can mention here. Hmm. Start with any G. First of all, for any R, integer R, multiply by X power R. X power R is how much? 1 R 0 1. I mentioned you, right? 1 1 0 1 power R is 1 R 0 1. In fact, 1 T 0 1 is the additive group. T. So this time this, you can just check is this. What you're doing now? If C is not 0, that means you can divide A by C and get this to be 0, the first entry, 1, 1, the entry to be 0, right? So you can choose an R appropriately when C is not 0. So when C is not 0, you can divide A by C and replace A by the new A, which is residue mod C, the re remainder mod C. So you reduce the size of A now, remember, okay? <clears throat> like that you can do. Similarly, one can choose the left multiplication by some lower triangular y power r, that is 1, 0, minus 1, 1. One can reduce c mod a. You can, can do the same thing with 1, 0, r, 1, and then see what is happening. You, are, you will get c plus r a then, right? When a is not 0, you can reduce c mod a. So what we, what we are doing is simply the following. Start with the matrix A, the G. If it is if c is 0, it is already in a good form, so we will not right now bother about it. If c is not 0, you do this process to make A to be uh, smaller than this C by this. Replace A by the remainder when you divide A by C. Then again, divide C by this new A. So this becomes smaller. So it keeps on reducing like this. When you multiply on the left side by some power of X and some power of Y like that, it keeps on reducing. Ultimately, one of them has to become zero. One of A and C becomes zero. So what we have done is simply division algorithm. What, what about the other one? Suppose this has become 0. Huh? So matrix has determinant 1. That means this product equal to 1. There are two integers whose so product is 1. So this is better be plus or minus 1. That's what I'm saying here. One of them is 0, other becomes plus or minus 1. So G becomes either this or something like this. Okay. Because if, if A has become 0, then it must look like this. And when C has become 0, it has become like this. So this is after what? After the process of multiplying on the left side by some power of X and some power of Y, etc. You might do, you might have to do a few times. You remember, you divide A by C, there is a remainder. Then divide C by the remainder, you get a remainder of that. This is the process, right? And divide this by the remainder, you get the remainder. So this is a division algorithm. So after finite stage, that means uh, you get these two, one of these two types of matrices. What is this matrix? This matrix is simply your uh, power of x or minus of that. Minus, is, minus identity is already expressible. We know that. Okay. 
And in the case of G1, you just have to do one more process, multiply on the right side by the power of x, namely this, and you get this. And you know that this matrix you can get as x, y inverse x. So notice these things. These are very nice little relations, which is very easy to remember. X, y inverse x is this matrix whose square is minus identity. So here is the matrix of uh, order 4 and inversion. Can you please mute yourself, whoever it is, or ask me a question? Okay, so, so we have already, okay, oh, I have, uh, this is a simple gamma, so this is almost time I have. Okay. Gamma is, um, time. gamma is the notation for, uh, the same person is talking today also. Hmm. Okay. So look at this uh, PSL2Z, that is the quotient of SL2Z by plus or minus identity. And then we have shown actually that these two will generate. Um, we have shown that these two elements generate SL2Z, so generate the whole of PSL2Z, the images generate. PSL to Z. So we always regard this matrix as elements of PSL to Z. Understanding that we are identifying S with S mod plus minus identity, which means S with minus S and T with minus T. Why we are doing that is simply the following reason. Hmm? Why we are considering PSL to Z instead of SL to Z is because we are looking at the action of uh, your group SL to Z, let's say, on say complex number Z by this transformation. Z goes to AZ plus B by CZ plus B. This is sometimes called a fraction linear transformation. And if you say that Z is in the a point on the upper half plane, then this also happens in the upper half plane. Okay, determinant is plus one here. So determinant is it's an SL to the matrix. So it will be again in the upper half plane. You can check that. Meaning the imaginary part of Z is positive. The imaginary part of this is also positive. In fact, the imaginary part of this you can calculate, which will come in our calculations is something like many part of Z divided by mod CZ plus D whole square, something like that. So it remains again positive. Anyway, so what, what I'm doing going to do in the next few minutes here now is show that these two matrices actually freely generate and we can get a sort of kind of a, okay, what's called a fundamental domain. It just takes a couple of minutes and, okay, so, what is the matrix T by this action? T is nothing but translation. So Z plus one divided by one. Okay. And what is Z action of S? It is just one divided by minus Z. Okay. So this is some kind of inverse. The reason for minus sign is that we ensure that point is again on the upper half plane. If you are taking 0, 1, 1, 0, then it will be one by Z. The point on the upper half plane goes to the lower half plane. We are letting it on the upper half plane. Okay, for gamma in matrix in PSL2Z, we observe the first of all that imaginary part of gamma Z, as I mentioned, is simply one small calculation tells you. So imaginary part of AZ plus B by CZ plus D, nothing but imaginary part of Z divided by mod CZ plus D square. Fix any point in the upper half plane. So when C and D vary, there is a disk around the origin. You know that because it's discrete, so there's no non-zero lattice point. So there is some gamma for this. This num this imaginary part is. Imagine gamma z is maximal. That is this for which this is minimal. Remember, C D is not 0, 0. Okay. So this group. So for which you are choosing a gamma for which you're fixing a z. After fi fixing any point z, you're looking at a gamma for which this is maximum possible. Okay. And the gamma that will be made up out of the S and T, not just any gamma, but SNT. That is how you'll show that any any element of gamma is made up of SNT. So, if necessary, we may replace your gamma by t power j times gamma. What does it mean? That means uh, t is the translation one one zero only. Remember. So when you have uh, when it's translating to the left or the right, t will translate to the right. T inverse will translate to the left by one unit, right? Z plus one or Z minus one. 
because of that, you can always put the whole thing inside this strip like this, minus half to half, which is width one. So every point can be brought into this strip of width one, first of all. Next is because imagine the part of S times gamma Z. S is that inverse mat inversion matrix, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Okay, since in minus 1, 0 means what is minus? So C and D are minus 1 and 0. That means CZ plus D will be just this. So, but this is bigger than imaginary part of gamma z if in this thing. So, this quantity is choice because we have chosen a gamma for which this is maximum possible. Okay, so what we are saying is that if we have chosen a gamma for which this imaginary part of gamma z is maximum possible, mod of gamma z is automatically outside the unit circle. Mod of gamma z is bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, so we have uh, a matrix which is made up of S and T's so that we have brought any point in the upper half plane to inside this vertical strip of width one and outside the unit circle. Maybe I should show the picture before and um, okay. So let's call this region as F minus half to half this. So this is misprint here, typo here, minus half here, minus half, okay. Mm. So strip minus half to half, the vertical strip and in that outside the unit circle. That's your F here. So every point gets transformed to an equivalent point by moving by something in a word in S and T. Huh? And I want to say no point inside can be moved to any other point. Okay, But uh, let me just keep that proof here because I want to show you a picture now. First, see this picture. So here is this unit circle here. And this is uh, strip that I talked about minus half to half. Inside the strip, I'm just looking at points which are outside the unit circle. Okay, these are the. So in other words, this uh, set is going to be what is called a fundamental domain for action of the modular group. What it means is that every point in the upper half plane can be brought uh, by, by transforming by an element of modular group to one point inside this. Not only that, no two point inside this are can be transforms of each other. That is the previous slide, which I didn't show here. This is one. If they are equivalent, then they are on the boundary. Okay, we can even show more. What is the thing? And I don't want to get into it. So point is, this is called, a, this is a very nice region. Each point is equivalent. That is transformed by gamma to a point inside F. And no two interior points are equivalent. Such a set is called a fundamental domain. Um, since we have done this by process of just taking matrices generated by SNT, that means whole of SNT will generate it. We have considered a fundamental domain. This is very useful because more generally, whenever your group is acting on some nice space and there is a fundamental domain, which means every point is transformed to exactly one of the points in that domain, then it is many properties you can read off about that group. For example, you know the algebraic property I mentioned that PSL 2Z is a free product of Z mod 2 and Z mod 3. This is a read off on the fundamental domain because fundamental domain, whatever is a fixed point here, for example, they can happen only on the boundary. So when you do that, there'll be one fixed point. So see this line and this line will be identified because translation takes minus half to half, right? The vertical line minus half to the vertical, uh, vertical line plus half. So these are equivalent all right, okay? But nothing inside will be equivalent. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is, this group structure of PSL 2Z, the modular group, is nothing but the free product of the stabilizer of fixed points. This, I mean, for there is a fixed point, there is there is a point fixed by some elements. So look at the stabilizer. When you look at the stabilizer, you'll get two stabilizer, one Z mod 2, one Z mod 3. One for this uh, point I here, this is the point I here. Hmm? And look at the stabilizer of that. And then look at the point, these two points are the same points to the third root of unity, cube root of unity, then that is stabilizer is Z mod 3. So Z mod 2, Z mod 3. So this is much more general. That's the reason I flashed this fundamental domain in front of you. Many, many linear groups, you can read out their group structure by looking at their fundamental domains. What are generators and so on. Okay. Let me just, uh, let's see, uh, so a free abelian group of rank N. So it looks like I'm just doing group theory here, but you'll see matrices will have to come in. So free abelian group is another name for the 
any group isomorphic to z power n okay so it will not look like n tuples but it may be isomorphic to the n tuples hmm? for example you know that the group a comma a where a goes through integers is isomorphic to z okay it is not uh, um, of the form just a okay so it can look in another form isomorphically they are z power n more generally when an abelian group arises any abelian group which is generated by finitely many elements finitely many abelian group is isomorphic to some copies of z some number of m number of copies times some finite abelian groups and you can always put in a certain kind of a unique form by doing like this you can put it in a form that z, like z mod d1 z is in this integer mod d1 that abelian group integer mod d2 integer mod dr where d1 divides d2 d2 divides d3 and d, like that when you put it like this these dis are all unique up to sign of course okay so any finitely generated abelian group you know has this structure the structure theorem can be written in this form which is convenient form um d1 dividing d2 and so as you see even linear, linear algebra when you look at invariant factors or matrices and so on that's what this is is invariant factors because of integer matrices this is what it will give these integers are called in, invariant factors of this group actually um the structure theorem follows um okay anyway so what happens is if you have free abelian group of rank n what does it mean that means the group isomorphic to z power n in which case of course n is uniquely determined hmm? that's a easy exercise and take any subgroup of that automatically h is isomorphic to z power r for some r less than equal to okay first thing is if whenever you have subgroup group isomorphic to z power n any subgroup is isomorphic to z power r and and this is before knowing all this okay in fact you want to you, you want to get this theorem and all from this take any subgroup we first prove that any subgroup is a free abelian again of some rank less than equal to okay so it is generated by some r elements so z power r of course generated by r elements right you have e1 e2 e, uh, er anyway so this e1 e2 en is different notation so there is a basis of your g of n, n elements see when a group is isomorphic to z power n it will have basis of n elements when i say basis it is like a vector space but it is not vector space right these are z power n that means uh, i don't want to use the words but as a module as an okay z module this is the basis this is free abelian group so that means every element of g is a unique integer linear combination of these gis such n elements you can find that is what this group g is what we are saying is that given any subgroup of such a group can choose a basis even if you have original some basis you have to change the basis some new basis is there such that multiples of these basis vectors okay form a basis of h first r basis vectors where r is less than equal to n so any subgroup is going to look like this so there is a new thing here is that see in vector spaces vector space of dimension n any subspace Uh, if you have the subspace has dimension n, of course it is equal to it. Cannot have proper subspace whose dimension is equal to n. But here such a thing can happen. So, for example, here means analogous factor is more subtle. So, if, suppose you have basis of n element e one e two e n. So, think of a subgroup H which is of the form two e one two e two two e n. Okay, this is a two e one two e two two e n is the basis of H. So, obviously. this is a proper subgroup of that but it also has basis of n elements okay so analog of subspace of dimension n which is proper has dimension less than n is false here in any case okay so the theorem will tell you that there is a basis for which there are multiples like this where d1 divided d2 etc which forms a basis of this okay and then suppose you are want to, you are interested in the The notion of uh, what is called structure of a finitely generated abelian group. That means any finitely generated abelian group. Suppose it generates n elements. You take the free abelian group generated by n elements and write, write your group as a quotient. So when you write as a quotient, the kernel is this subgroup of this form. That is why this is important. So what happens? Suppose you have chosen this. What is G by H then? The quotient group G by H. Everything is abelian. So G by H is a group. It is isomorphic to What is G? G is Z e one plus Z e two plus Z e n. H is Z d one e one plus Z d two etc. So when you look at the quotient G by H, it is going to look like 
Z mod D1 plus Z mod D2 plus Z mod DR. And the rest of the N minus R things will be just Z cross Z cross Z, N minus R copies. So that is how you get the structure theorem for finitely generated appealing groups. But why I mentioned all this is because it is nothing but rephrasing of matrix statement. Okay, I just mentioned, I just wrote here what I mentioned just now. Okay. If H is a subgroup of ZN, the quotient group is a product of cyclic groups like this. So now how does it want, okay, how to, for example, you know this algebraic theorem. Let's say you want to find the DIs so that you know the structure of the group. To know the structure of the group, you know how to know the DIs. I'm saying that uh, uh, matrices will help you that. Matrix groups is going to help them. So existence of basis as mentioned as in the invariant factor theorem. Okay, so this is this theorem here. This is what I call the invariant factor theorem. The big group has a basis and the subgroup has a basis of this form. That's called invariant factor theorem. Then I'm saying that statement is nothing but the following statement. Given any M by N matrix of integer entries whose rank is possible, maximum possible, that is maximum, of, uh, that is minimum of M and N. Okay. This could be a rectangular matrix. So if it is three by two matrix, so maximum possible rank is two. Okay. Like that. So there exists an invertible M by M matrix over integers. Okay, the pin determinant of P is plus minus one. And N by N matrix, which is over integers, determinant plus minus one. You pre-multiply A by this matrix and post multiply it by Q. Then this matrix looks like a diagonal matrix. I'm just saying diagonal within inverted commas because this is a rectangular matrix. Okay. This is M by M, M by N, N by N. So it is M by N matrix. So depending on it, it is three cross two, then the first two diagonal entries are there. Similarly, 2 cross 3 again, like that. So, as much possible diagonal entries. So, this is the same statement. This is a little exercise. If you, uh, so, what I am trying to say is that a purely matrix statement, which can prove using purely matrix theory, of course, properties of integers, namely, usual the fact that a division algorithm and so on, you have to use. That's the only thing you can use for integers. You can prove this fact. And this fact, you can rephrase quite quickly as the uh, fact about group theory that I mentioned, invariant factor theorem. So now question is why it's not just okay rephrasing, okay, how does the big use? It should be useful. So one of the useful things is, can we obtain the invariant factors, those DIs, remember? These DIs, or these DIs, can we get them? Just without doing any calculation. And because of the rephrasing, we can do that actually. Here is how. So as I said, for any A, take any rectangle matrix and look at H1A to be the GCD of all the entries. So all the one cross men. H2A to be GCD of all two cross two minus. H3A is GCD of all three cross three minus, etc. Obviously, when you see the way it's defined, hmm, H1 will divide H2A, H3 like that. Okay, H2A will divide H3A because you're looking at all uh, three cross three minus for H3A, right? Like that. So if A has a full possible rank, then for any, whatever P and Q may be, these numbers don't change. These DCDs don't change. Why they don't change is very easy to see also because these matrices are actually generated by elementary matrices. So matrices which have, which are like identity matrix, except one entry, some i j th place, i not equal to j, is a non-zero integer. Okay, such matrices will generate this. So when you do that, when you what does such a matrix do? Elementary matrix, when you multiply your birth, you can easily check. GCD does not change. You are, you are, so you are adding a multiple of the i th row to the j th row. You find that this GCD does not change. So only for that, you need to check. And then you need to check that all such matrices will generate this. So once you have those facts, then for any element of JLMZ and any element of JLMZ, these are same. That means invariant factors do not change after doing P from this side and Q from that side. So to do the um, HIA here is same thing as doing HI of P times A times Q. But what did he say about P times A times Q? P times A times Q is a diagonal matrix. Okay, so what are, for a diagonal matrix, what are the HIs? It's very easy to see. Diagonal matrix, obviously the HIs are nothing but hmm, D1, hmm, D1, D2, D1, D2, D3, like that. Remember what is D1, D2 and the 
d1 is dividing d2 d1 is d2 is dividing d3 like that we are getting so d1 is a h1a the gcd of all the entries is going to be d1 because d1 is dividing all of them okay similarly d1 times d2 will be the so in other words we have explicitly hia simply okay simply the um, So what we wanted was DIs. But DIs are nothing but this. I'm saying because H1 is D1, huh? H2 is D1 times D2. So D2 is this. So D3 is this, etc. So given a, a matrix, you can find it the this thing, and you can. In fact, we can use it also very quickly. We'll use it in one of the examples in the tutorials. So I want to just spend the next few minutes giving one special thing which I asked. Uh, I'll share another file. One of the summer students to do. Let's see where is that. Um, what to open that? Let's see. That file is. Uh, I cannot see that file. One second. Hmm. One second, sorry. I want to see where that file is. So, yeah, now I can see it. So, this is from a Word file that my student, summer student, created. So, so I want to produce, uh, see. So, today, as I said, I'm mostly talking about groups of integer matrices. So I, uh, I, we already know from Minkowski's theorem that if G is a finite subgroup of JLN Z, then G is isomorphic to a subgroup of JLN Z mod PZ. You just now check that kernel does not contain any element of finite order. So as soon as you have finite subgroup that under this homomorphism, it goes injectively, right? Kernel has no elements of finite order. So any subgroup of finite subgroup goes injectively to this. So to calculate, for example, what is the possible order of an element, you just have to calculate what are the possible orders of these groups and so on. And you have so much freedom. Every odd prime is there. Okay, so it puts a severe restriction on finite subgroups of GL and Z. In particular, immediately here, up to isomorphism, there are only finitely many finite subgroups because it's a finite group here. So everything is going to be isomorphic to a subgroup of this finite group. Every finite subgroup of GL and Z is going to be isomorphic to a finite a subgroup of this finite group. Whatever odd prime you choose. Okay. So definitely finiteness is there. Okay. Any finite group of order n we know already can be put inside JL and Z, right? Now, how do you do that? Remember, it's a permutation matrix. Okay, so that's what it is. So we first we will sort of investigate the nature of these possible orders of uh, elements, then n increases. Okay. Now we are not fixing the size of n, uh, so size of the matrix. What is the possible orders of finite subgroups? So we are thinking that, okay, maybe the subgroup of order n factorial is there in JL and Z, namely the permutation matrices. Maybe that is the biggest order. But uh, first thing is we observe that there can have bigger orders. For example, look at this cyclic subgroup of diagonal matrices where plus minus ones are there. So you have a subgroup of order 2 power n times n factorial. Sort of slightly bigger than the n factorial. I shouldn't say slightly bigger than 2 power n. Okay. What I'm saying is uh, with this uh, additional thing here. So we do have things, subgroups of orders bigger than n factorial inside JL and Z, namely this. That's what we said here. Now, so here is a thing why I want to observe nice fact. That so we are talking about integer matrices. And if you look about matrices over rational number, which is a field, we might think there are many, many subgroups compared to this. This will have very few subgroups because just now we checked that Minkowski said, oh, okay, any finite subgroup of this is actually isomorphic to finite subgroup of the finite group JL and Z by, Z by P. So these are very few. This might have many more, but it's not true. What we want to say is that any finite subgroup of GL and Q is actually conjugate to a subgroup of GL and Z. 
So automatically it puts a bond on the. So essentially, any subgroup of JLN, finite subgroups come from JLNZ up to conjugacy. So why is that? It's very easy proof. Uh, since I have uh, 10 minutes, uh, I'll say something in two, three minutes. Let G be a finite subgroup of JLNK, say order K. And what we form is this. So JLNZ is what? JLNZ is acting on Z power N, right? Column Z power N. So we, what we are going to look at is JLNQ element. This is it. Okay. This group is a finite subgroup GLNQ. So these matrices small g have rational entries, all right, but only finitely many such matrices. So look at G, Z power N. So this finite sum you look at. Here is a abelian group. Okay. So it could be like half Z power N plus 1 by 3 Z power, I don't know, whatever, depending on what are there in G. Some finitely many. So finite sum here. But of course, since identity limit is here, this group does contain Z power N itself. Also, it is not much bigger in some sense. Why? Because this is a finite group. Hmm? So these matrices, each matrix in this finite group, uh, look at all the possible diag uh, what you call it, denominators of all the entries. Okay. So there is a maximum, there is an entry which is LCM of all these entries because finite number. Of, you have finite limit elements in G and each element of G is a matrix of certain size N cross N and each of the entries has a denominator. So you can definitely take the maximum or the LCM of all the denominators. So in other words, if you take a, if there is an integer D such that when you multiply by any element of this by D, everything, all the denominators are cancelled. That means it is contained in Z power N. What it means is that F is caught between, it contains Z power N and it is contained in 1 by D times Z power N. Okay. So in other words, actually it's a, you know that any subgroup of a free abelian group is free abelian and so on. So F is free abelian, but it contains a free abelian group of rank N, namely Z power N. So it is itself free abelian of rank N. Okay, this is just to show that F is isomorphic to Z power N. There is an isomorphism from F to Z power N. That means that isomorphism is given by some matrix, hmm, which is, uh, call it C. Of course, F might have uh, denominators, right? So that matrix will be rational matrix only. This is simply an isomorphism between this free abelian group Z power N and the free abelian group F. And that is given by invertible matrix over rational numbers. That's C. So when you look at this C, then you can simply see C inverse GF is contained in this. So C inverse GC takes Z power N to Z power N for every G. That means what is what are the matrices which take Z power N to Z power N inside GLN Q? Simply elements of GLN Z. Okay. So because of that, C inverse GC is contained in GLNZ. That's what we have said. Subgroup of GLNZ. Hence, any finite subgroup of GLQ, namely G, is conjugate to a subgroup of GLNZ. So it's a very simple but striking fact that finite subgroup of GLNQ, nothing new you get. Of course, you can conjugate. You can artificially do something. You take a finite subgroup of GLNZ, create some denominators by conjugating by a single matrix in GLNQ. Okay, so that of course no longer inside JLNZ, but it is just if, uh, okay, it's actually isomorphic to a subgroup of JLNZ. Okay, now I'll start finish with this uh, possible orders of elements of JLNZ. Just to give for an example first, how to construct uh, what is the maximum possible order of an element. Actually, these kind of questions are very difficult even for something like permutation group and all. Look at SN, what is the maximum possible order of an element? Okay, you know, you can easily study it, but uh, it involves some deep things. When you study the maximum possible order of uh, SN, because you have to broker the disjoint cycles and take the LCM of the orders and so on. Uh, so when you do that, what is the maximum possible order? When you look at, it is intimately connected to some deeper things like prime number theorem and things like that. So I must warn you that even simple questions like maximum possible order of a element of SN, has deep connections and it has connections with the GLNZ also. What is the maximum possible order of a matrix in GLNZ? Look at this four cross four matrix. You can actually check that it has ordered 12 and you can check that 12 will be the maximum possible order. We'll come to that in a theory in, as part of the theory. So let me just recall very quickly what is meant by the cyclotomic polynomial. Mth cyclotomic polynomial consists of that polynomial which has primitive mth roots of unity as roots. So it's a polynomial. Hmm? Whose roots are primitive mth root. Primitive means it's an mth root of unity and not dth root of unity for any d smaller than m. So genuinely mth roots. 
How many of them are there? You can easily check it's the number of uh, primitive mth roots, five of m, five, five of m is the number of integers, co prime to m and less than or equal to m. And as it happens, this beautiful polynomial is actually as integer coefficients. Okay, although it's these are all complex numbers. Okay, gamma is like e power two pi i by m and so on, but this is an integer integer polynomial and it is irreducible as an integer polynomial. And in fact, these polynomials can be gotten from this polynomial. Take all nth roots of unity. Every nth root of unity, which is the root of this, is a primitive dth root of unity for some d dividing n. Because of that, you can have this equation. So anyway, these cyclotomic polynomials are very nice, and we'll use them to construct matrices of finite order. So recall companion matrices. So if you have a cyclotomic polynomial, we'll create matrices of specified orders. Let's see what what possible orders are there. Um, consider any m and the corresponding cyclotomic polynomial phi m. We you remember that degree of phi m is this phi of m, small phi of m. Okay, so you consider a, a group of phi m cross phi m matrices and order m. Let's see how to do that. Look at simply the companion matrix of this. You know that companion matrix of a polynomial looks like this, and you do it for phi m x. Okay, so the degree is k. Of course, is a k cross k matrix. And its characteristic polynomial is the polynomial to start with. Companion matrix, that's why it's called companion. Mm -hmm. Similarly, so for phi mx, you make this companion matrix. Uh, and uh, the advantage of, okay, so as I said, this is the characteristic polynomial in general. And in our case, suppose you construct companion matrix of phi m, its characteristic polynomial is this. But you see, this is an irreducible polynomial. Okay, so that puts a nice condition. Whenever you have, uh, so since it's a characteristic polynomial, phi m a satisfies this, a power m is identity. If a is a minimal polynomial, a has minimal polynomial m a, you know that it is going to divide this, but this is irreducible. So it is a minimal polynomial also. That shows that m is actually the order. It's not just m, a power m is identity, but because of this, the companion matrix will have e order equal to m, simply because of irreducibility of phi m. Okay, so this is one way of constructing, but you, for all you know, that may be a very special way of constructing. Maybe there are orders or bigger orders are possible. So let me just go to not see this example. It's there in the notes. You can look at it. So this is the basic theorem. I, I will stop with this theorem. Let's see. What I want to say is that uh, we want to find a way to determine for a given integer m, there exists a matrix of order m and n cross n matrix. Hmm? We want to do that. So here is the theorem which says that that depends on his prime decomposition actually. So take you take a number m. So you want to know when does when is there a matrix of order m in JLN Z or same thing as JLN Q because you know the finite subgroups are conjugate to subgroups here. So break your uh, m into prime powers and write the prime in an increasing order like this. Then your JLN Z has an element of order m if and only if. This number summation pi power e i minus one into pi minus one is less than or equal to n plus one. Okay, or actually less than or equal to n is a generic case. Less than or equal to n plus one is possible when p one power e one is two. That is, first is two times some odd prime powers. In that case, uh, this condition should be satisfied. So the proof of this theorem is simply depending on the cyclotomic polynomials. So since my time is up, I don't want to take, it's here, it's very elementary. So it's a very beautiful theorem. Okay. Uh, let's see whether I have made any other comments here. Um, yeah, that example falls into this. Ah, so because of this criterion given by the theorem, we have amusing corollaries like this. Because you see the condition is in dumb prime powers and uh, something happening. Right, summation pi power ei minus one, etc., etc. Because of that, when you look at even size and odd size, this has an element of certain order. If and only if next odd one has the same element of order m. So if you directly ask someone to prove this, it's going to be very mysterious. Okay, only by using that theorem one can do it. Okay, so I'll stop sharing this. I'll share this. Uh, I'll upload these two files, and I have very few problems in. Uh, Actually written down for tutorial, but we can discuss more things related to this. So I'll stop here. If you have any immediate questions, you can ask me. Otherwise, we can discuss during 2.30.
tutorial. Okay. Thank you then. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank thank you, you, sir. you very much. 2.30 will see.